a most warm welcoming back to this our show, Think Tech Hawaii's Human Humane Architecture, and I'm your host, Martin Despain. This is my very first show in 2024, because last week uh, my fellow host, DeSoto Brown, was kicking off, and uh, we will both be back next week. So for today, we're going to continue to find out what's going on in Honolulu. We are having the biggest building boom ever since the heydays of statehood here. And uh, while in statehood, trying to you know, question us if we're nostalgic or not, but I think we can say we're not, at least not entirely, when uh, America was at its best and then people who came to Hawaii tried even better. That is, as some feel, us included, not the case anymore these days. And we try to find out, and we thought we find some clues in a fellow city in the heartland of the USA, which is Chicago, Illinois. And we're in our 25th um, investigation episode of trying to find out. So um, we also uh, don't want to have an isolated, insulated view here. We want to get ourselves out. And I have to say, while I'm Obviously, want to wish us a happy new year. It's harder than ever because what's going on in the world makes it increasingly. And even me having just come back from the holidays where we sent me out half around the world to uh, my native Germany uh, with uh, coming back, these impressions here, it's hard for me to feel like I'm back in paradise when I see fighter jets uh, over me here in Waikiki. And there are two kinds of fighter jets. First, the ones that we wish that wouldn't have come back uh, so much, which are the war fighter jets, uh, which are fighting both uh, utmost challenges that we have these days, which is people and planet peacefulness. So they fight both because we kill people with these machines. And we also kill our planet with the carbon that these machines put out. But our private sort of passenger uh, machines that get us here, me including, are only better because they're not killing directly, but indirectly because they're also climate killers, because they have a very, very high carbon footprint, me including. And uh, on top of things, this is the bottom uh, row of, of pictures here. I came back from the Northern Hemisphere, which is uh, relating then to Chicago, because usually even in my very days in Nebraska and then even in Arizona, I could not avoid the Northern Hemisphere and most of my flights back home had to go through the city of Chicago. And in many cases, what you see down there is what happened to me. My plane had to be de-eyed. And you can only imagine, uh, you know, the additional impact on the environment, on that stuff having to be sprayed on the wings there. So this is pretty bad. And you know, on the on the bottom right, uh, the 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 news quote there is you know just trying to probably make me feel better when United Airlines, which is my carrier, a partner of Star Alliance, together with Lufthansa, uh, uh, promise that they will try to make the A380, the Airbus that I consider to be my plane. You see a the little toy model of it in the bottom in the middle there, which is um, in my little shelf up on my wall next to a Nick Pushar uh, poster that reminds me of my American citizenship, which I was granted in that Hawaii theater. So that airplane there uh, was uh, was put in place, uh, first introduced uh, the year of 2005 when I uh, returned to the U.S. And I've been flying with this. It's a great plane. It's very comfortable. They got the air pressure right. It's a big plane, and that's why it was you know, it's not very efficient and effective. Uh, both you need to have a lot of passengers and it consumes a lot of fuel. So it was actually out commissioned during COVID, but coming out of COVID and getting us back to almost full capacity as it feels of tourism as our major economy here in Hawaii, it is back. And again, it's back with a with both a smiling and a and 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 a and a, and a crying uh, face because again, it's um, it's good to have it back, but also we have back its environmental impact. And we wanna encourage you to, to think about all these things more than ever these days, whatever you do. Like for example, when mine is a Lufthansa plane, not Singapore Airlines here, and it only goes certain routes, I flew this time not through San Francisco, but through LAX. 
So in the airplane, they were serving us as they do uh, dinner and breakfast. So this is my cutlery for dinner, and this is the breakfast one. So we also kicked off our first PIM class uh, two days ago, which is the tourist industry management that Martin Ancelini, who was our guest for many of the shows, his proposal for Lahaina. The two of us are also now coaching uh, the coming um, uh, you know, hospitality managers. And we gave this out as food for thought. And we said, what's, what's good about it? It's reusable, right? Bad about it is in comparison to this one here. And what's the, the pro of the one is the con of the other one. This is heavy. This is light. So this is reusable, but it, it, it puts on weight. So it uses more kerosene as of now. This is basically uh, biodegradable. It even decomposes almost in your mouth, which is a little weird, but it's very light. So again, there isn't just black and white. There's shades of gray in between that we want you guys to look at. Um, LAX again. Um, so, you know, coming here, people coming here in tourism has a big impact. I had in the cold there, I had one day of skiing, which again, we should feel bad about things we do and think about it. But the heaviest impact, which I did not know having grown with skis on because my mother is Austrian, hi mom, um, is actually not what you do uh, while being there. You know, the ski lift and the increasingly because of climate change, artificial snow, uh, but is actually getting there. So the closer you are, the less is basically your transit, your commuting. So um, th that, is, that is the point. And that's for us here also, how people come here. Because in the, in the pre-state um, of days, they came with, uh, with, with ships, right? The steamship by Met, and then came Jet Aid. And, and ever since, we come with Jet. Again, we're not yet there. Hopefully, United Airlines is successful with converting the A380 into hydrogen. But until then, uh, again, we can do the, the carbon you know, trading and pay extra and try to offset it. But, but it's still, you know, we, we, have that, we have that burden here. We have that impact that we carry. So uh, having gone through LAX, uh, also architecturally, again, this cutlery has also, uh, we have the Venice Biennale uh, curatorship uh, just announced for 2025. It's an Italian, Carlos Reddy who's doing everything that one should do these days. He's all over the place, maybe, you know, a little lost, but who am I to say that because I'm the same and our emerging ger generation is doing that too. The last Italian having curated the Venice Biennale was, a, and, and the turn of the millennium was uh, Massimo Milano Fuktas, fellow Italian who gave out the agenda of, um, of, of ethics and aesthetic. So there is, the aesthetical part, which in the sort of existential thread of mankind and womankind um, in that order, because we men do cause most of the harm to the world, aesthetics seems to get on the back burner, but we shouldn't, uh, because there is something about nature as our best raw model that we should return to. And nature is beautiful uh, in a performative way. Uh, this cutlery, as uh, the link uh, in the middle uh, at the bottom, is by Wolf Karnagel. This is a legendary German gestalter who has created this one here. And this is why it lasts. Things that are designed, gestalted in a beautiful way, they, they last. And it's an increasing awareness of us that one of the main columns that we call sustainability is lasting, keeping things in the life cycle. That is true for everything. That is true for automobiles, for cutlery, for clothing, and it's certainly true for architecture, because this is what the show is about, human humane architecture. And the main piece at LAX, which I went through, and our main mid-century modern master, Ron Lindgren, has just sent me his newest, or asked his newest movie recommendation, which is Ferrari, the beginning of Ferrari uh, from the 1950s. Uh, thank you, Ron. And uh, you said the two of us are automobile fans, DeSoto and I, but you are the third one, and we have to reconvene our respective show to this extent. Again, uh, airplanes and, uh, and automobiles are our vehicles for thought to think about. So these mobile devices, so to speak, are vehicles for thought for immobile, as how um, in the uh, German and the French language we call real estate. 
So the most recognizable uh, real estate piece of architecture that's been around is that thing that we see in the in the in the top uh, row, and this is this is from the 19 uh, late 50s early 60s by architect uh, William Pereira and Lookman. Pereira is of uh, a Portuguese descent, which we have a lot of ties to here on the island, and he's also known. I flew out to. Um, uh, um, San Francisco, and in San Francisco, he's known for what he had built a decade later, which is the Trans American Pyramid, which is still considered to be one of the most iconic, lasting, and therefore sustainable high rises. Actually, some argue, including us, more sustainable than what's recently been built in topping it in height, which is the uh, Salesforce Tower by Caesar Pelli. And we will talk about that a little bit later in the show. So a little bit more about this theme building here, which is that sort of space age fighter thing that um, ever since this one, nothing better has been built. And this is kind of ironic and, and striking. You see in the very center of the image shows what's around it these days. These are pictures I took just uh, three days ago. You see that very uh, hideous tower to the left of it, which is probably from, I couldn't even find the date when it was built. It looks like the days when I had to go to architecture school in the early 90s when postmodernism had just tanked. And it's this kind of really desperate attempt to make something that looks historic but isn't. And then there is these lighting fixtures that look futuristic, but not anywhere close to what that theme building there is, which is, again, um, talking movies. There's just Priscilla out, which is the movie about the life of Priscilla Presley, Elvis Presley's wife. Last year, there was one of the many other and the most recent uh, Elvis film out. And there is a scene, I think, that we um, um, have um, uh, a reference to in our probably coming up in our automobile architecture show where uh, Elvis and Priscilla drive in a Mercedes 600 to the airport. And it's spe specifically staged then around that most iconic building. And, and people dismiss it as you know, the Hollywood architecture and, you know, from that sort of uh, Bauhausian point of view of a structural and material honesty is a steel structure that covers itself up with makeup uh, and that stucco fell off some years ago. So there's all this criticism and you can say this building doesn't really have a function, a necessary and essential function. It's not a, a navigation tower like we assume the tower, the ugly tower to the left of it in the middle picture. But um, it is a very iconic building. And uh, the image is at the middle on the left and to the right is pictures I took on my um, moving here to Hawaii in 2012 when it had been reanimated because it originally had something very, very innovative and provocative that has a lot to do with us in Hawaii because it had this restaurant that was a revolving restaurant. And that reminds us of one of our favorite buildings, show quoted in the middle at the top. This is the Alamoana building by John Graham. Same year in 61, this was America at its best, right? Everywhere it tried to do the coolest stuff. The Alamoana building was not just cool, but also cool literally and figuratively because it was recognizing our tropical condition here and it had retractable sun shading louvers that unfortunately in these bad 90s I was talking about some they took off and and was was cranking up the AC and ever since it's there you know too naked so we're saying bring it back so also here they brought back the the restaurant at Disney in its imagineering department was maybe going a little too over the board with the interior kind of Jetsons like but it it was nice and the picture at the very bottom, uh, the very middle on the right is one of the most delicious, I think it was a spicy chicken burger that you see there that I've ever been eating. And little did I know that the year after the, the, the restaurant has closed and has ever since been closed and the building really waits to be reanimated with some, with some meaningful function. There's a Bob Hope veteran institution at the bottom that's very meaningful. Uh, Ron, you're a veteran in many ways, also a Vietnam veteran. That's good. But we need that restaurant back. We also need the restaurant back in the Alamoana building. And both uh, have been rotating and they're both now um, locked. So we need to unlock them, bring that back. Because again, 
Um, it's, it's, it is shocking that ever since LAX, LAX was, by the way, also designed by Pereira, the whole thing. And the horseshoe layout is a little bit annoying, I have to say, from a point of view of a passenger, because it's a long, very unattractive uh, walking uh, along with caps and cars and not interesting scenery along the way. So there's some serious need for some updating, some upgrading. But again, the centerpiece of that one is, is really up to these days, uh, the coolest. So we need to get America back to its coolest period. That gets us to the next uh, image because it was even intended to be even cooler because this is, was the original idea that the spider is sort of the watered down compromise. It was uh, by Pereira again, envisioned to be this gigantic dome. And while where I pulled this from NPR, um, the comments are manifold. Some say, hey, great, these were the greatest days, which we agree on. Some then say, which is also legitimate in these days of climate change, this would have been a big microwave and look at the amount of glass. And But we say there's technology out there today that we pointed out actually in the last show, uh, episode number 24, how one could retrofit um, uh, that Helmut Jahn building in, in downtown Chicago. So it was very visionary. And again, uh, we had that too. DeSoto just talked, so quote, top right about the Kaiser Dome that was built around the same days. And the other big show quote at the top left is our show about Henry J. Kaiser's avant-garde with the Kaiser Dome is the most funky uh, example of that one. And again, that did not happen. Um, and, uh, and unfortunately uh, for us, the Kaiser Dome is gone. Fortunately, LA still has the theme building. So talking uh, welcoming architecture when you come with aviation, um, uh, please go back to our Tropical Brutalist shows where we were looking at our airport, which is by the legendary Vladimir Osipov, which is where DeSoto grew up in a house designed by him here up the Diamond Head volcano. And the, 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 the airport was recognizing our tropical climate. It was very easy breezy. And it's decreasingly that because what they do to the airport is not living up to the additional um, um, you know, dimension of innovation that it has. And in fact, next slide, where I came from uh, is actually now reconnecting us to Chicago, although this is Munich. This is Munich, Germany. This is my destination. Uh, and my departure point, and this is how I am greeted, uh, pretty much. And you see uh, two pieces of architecture. One is the one on that big banner, which is what we have been talking about a lot, and we will continue to be, which many consider us included, the best architecture that we Germans have ever been coming up. And this is the 72 Olympics by Fry Otto and Günther Benisch, here used by this uh, cell phone uh, service provider, O2, as a backdrop. And the architecture it's placed around is the airport center. And this is by Chicago-based but German-born architect Helmut Jahn, who we talk a lot about in the show, and we will sort of continue to do this here. And doesn't this architecture look very Hawaii, right? This is roof architecture. This is what we should have here. It protects you from the main elements of the rain and the, the sails from the sun. So while we have that in Munich, Germany, and the recent uh, sort of additions to the airport does not have that to that extent, at least not in such a thoughtful way. There are some solar panels and some canopies there, but they don't really serve this, this function here that this year saves. There's also, I, I remember that Helmut was blamed and I think even sued for some really fancy uh, stairs that had glass pavers and people in the snow slipped on it and broke their leg. So I think it needed to be retrofitted to some concrete. Again, we don't have that snow here, so we could do these things, but we don't do these things anymore here these days. Uh, so I took this picture here upon um, arrival uh, around Christmas. You see the Christmas market there, and you also see a Grinch at the very top right, which Soda would say, hey, this is a German American adopting American culture. So next slide. So this slide here is, is, is Chicago O'Hare International Airport. And uh, the author of the DOM book that we had as a guide, it was just out and I was given the confidential uh, digital version that I had promised to destroy, which I did. And it's author Vladimir Belogolovsky here. I respect a lot because he's doing what we're thinking around and doing 
on a volunteer basis once a week. He's doing this to make a living, to write about architecture and being an architectural critic. So he's the pro. And I'm also jealous of him because we took on to write the Honolulu City Guide, uh, DeSoto and Bill Chapman and Don Hibbert with the students. And Vladimir took, I, I wouldn't say the easy way out, but for him the comfortable way out because he said, okay, there has been so many uh, architectural guides about because Chicago is considered to be one of the cradles of modern architecture. So there's so many books about the history of the Chicago School of Architecture, Louis Sullivan, um, you know, Frank Art Wright with Oak Park, Mies van der Rohe, that he says, I want to start in the late 70s. Um, and, and that's why there's a heavy um, uh, emphasis on postmodernism. And these pages here that I'm holding his book, showing, for example, again, um, the Thompson Center that we were talking about last time, and it's retrofitting for Google, and these beautiful postmodern drawings on the top right uh, out of Helmut's office. And also, when you come to Chicago and you leave Chicago uh, uh, internationally, uh, United Airlines hub is in Chicago, but I just updated myself. There are plans to move it permanently to Chicago. Hopefully not, because they have just, uh, they were out there in the burbs and they have moved actually to what used to be the, um, the Sears Tower, which is now renamed as the Willys Tower, but they used to be in there, or they're still in there recently, but they want to move to Denver instead. So, um, but this United Airlines terminal, again, built in the mid 80s by Helmut is really kind of um, iconically memorable. And it is very, um, you know, Helmutish. And it reminds me of Archineering, which uh, one year in my school of architecture in my youth, I had with Werner Sobeck as my structural professor. And he was teaming up with uh, Helmut, and uh, their theme was Archineering. And that only lasted for a while. Dan, our Patron told me there were two egos clashing into each other, so that only lasted so long. So another connection to us is here that we had Jeannie Gang come, and we dedicated many, many shows to her because we thought she did the most ambitious high-rise tower in our Kaka'ako, that we encourage her to do that a little bit better, to stay a little bit less sort of suggestive, but be more explicitly natural and perform more natural. But Jeannie is certainly one of the most promising, you know, stars in the orbit of architecture and the female architect. And we need more of these. So we're very happy to also see at the bottom right that Jeannie is um, uh, commissioned to design the next extension of the Chicago O'Hare global terminal. So that's what I will go through if I, again, transition through Chicago again. And you see here that it looks like it's a hybrid construction of concrete and, and wood. And it's a, a joint venturing, as we point out at the very bottom there in the text, between her firm, Studio Gang, and guess who? Solomon Cortwell Buens, which is that firm that we see here predominantly blessing us with high rises that we wish they would be more environmentally and with that culturally responsible. So again, hopefully, you know, if um, whoever developer comes back, um, maybe, the, you know, the, the Solomon Cortwell Buens guys, man, uh, need, again, uh, uh, the teamwork with, uh, with Jeannie. And um, hopefully they take our criticism as it's meant to be constructive, um, as to go to the next level of making their architecture the equivalent to our nature here, which is most beautifully um, uh, performing both uh, literally and, and figuratively. So uh, in the three minutes left, let's still go to the next slide uh, because this is another reference to automobiles and architecture. Uh, the office of, of, of Helmut uh, is, is so, um, I guess, um, luring for our patron Dan Kubrick that as Joe quoted at the very top uh, in, the, um, in the left, um, that he, when I met him, had a, uh, Pontiac GTO, which Ron, by the way, again, Ferrari, uh, Ferrari was owning that title for a model of that car and Ford was um, challenging that. And while in these days they probably would sue each other back then and it was more sportive and they basically had a race and Ford won and they could, they could keep that. Dan then, uh, basically because of the obsession with Porsches in the office of, 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 
Helmut Jan that we will see next week or no, next week we're going to uh, go back, which I'll tell you in a minute, uh, because that's important how we will do the next two shows. But after that, when we reconvene and do the volume 26 of this one year, you will see where that obsession comes from. So this is Dan's uh, mid 70s to mid 80s model, the Porsche. Uh, the Porsche has always, uh, never mind, you know, times move on and the architecture moved on. And Dan also drives a Boxster, which is a new Porsche, new kind of Porsche. But this 911 iconic one has always been kept. And Dan goes to the extent that at the bottom left, you see that he also worked on the engines, the guts of his cars in his loft. He lives pretty close to downtown, which we were pointing out at the beginning of the show. And you can see his 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 uh, his place is a is a is a hybrid of of a car shop and and a dwelling and at that time about now um uh, a year ago or more than a year ago uh, actually almost one and a half years ago when we did the footage for the show here dan was moving the office from where it was previously which will will, will remind you with a slide when we uh, do pick up from here but here you will see where he moved it to, uh, the office, which is the Wrigley Building. Yes, it's the chewing gum company that now actually stopped doing chewing gum. Ironically, I find this is from 1921. This is Graham Anderson Probst and White, one of the firms that our Tropical Tutor Bill is excited about. So Dan, again, moved it. So an office and contemporary architectural office recognizes the legacy of architectural um, uh, of architectural quality. And so it is with automobiles where we treasure the legacy of the 9-11. So next week is important because the Soto and uh, a project they, we, he'll put at the very end of his show, which is about uh, the beginning of um, uh, statehood and actually pre just predating statehood. And, and these are small hotels in Waikiki before everything went on steroids and got big. And this was uh, 70 years ago, and that was when DeSoto was born. So DeSoto's birthday is coming up. So next week, he will sort of lead into that and then conclude with the Breakers Hotel. And Ethel, please listen to me, because I will finally show up at your Breakers Hotel the week after, and we will do the, the, the anniversary celebration footage with you for the Soto and your breakers. So please look forward to that. So until then, uh, you see the accumulated viewer you are down there. So please keep joining us, keep subscribing us, keep supporting us this way because we're doing this all voluntarily. So we do this. Thank you for that. And until next week, please stay people and planet peaceful. Bye-bye.